Okay, it's five o'clock. Time for this session to start. <clears throat> Welcome everyone. My name is Dana Pettit. Uh, I work for Bluehost. We're going to be covering streamlining and simplifying your Perl code using map, grep, and sort. Uh, this is normally a bit longer presentation than we have here, so I'm going to be shortening things up a little bit. So if we feel a little rushed, that's normal. But if you have questions, please raise your hand and I'll, I'll cover things. Um, here at Yapsi, we actually see this statement coming true from Larry Wall, that we sometimes seem to be kind of a pearl cult. Let's go ahead and talk, see what we're going to be talking about. We're going to talk about some of the prerequisites, what you need to know before you'll understand the presentation. If you don't understand those things, you're going to be missing out on some of the material. We're going to go out what map, grep, and sort are. We're going to show how to use map, how to use grep, how to use sort, and then if we have some time, we'll go into combining them and doing some fun things like uh, some optimized sorts, with the, like the Schwartzian transform and so on. So here's the prerequisites. If you understand all this Perl code, you'll be fine. So things like uh, initializing an array, indexing into an ar a single element of the array, uh, indexing into a single element of a hash, using split, using a for each, and notice that we have a default on for each that we don't specify what we're printing, so it prints dollar underscore. Using the ternary operator, the question mark, colon. If you understand that, we're good. And using the um, vertic two, double vertical bars, which is an or with an equal. So it's the same as dollar z equals dollar z or empty string. If you understand that, you're good. So map, grep, and sort are merely iterator functions that allow us to operate on lists. Some, some, the syntax is actually very similar for them. Map performs an action on each element. Grep tests each element. And sort reorders the elements. So here's the general syntax for using this. See how very similar they look. There's a little difference here when we get to sort, and we'll talk about that when we get into sort. But the basic idea is they look very similar. That's why we've grouped them together in this hour, or this, these 20 minutes. So the general form is that we use a code block on, on most of these. So a code block is just the two curly braces with some code in there, some Perl code. And that tells map and grep and sort how to do things. Damien Conway rep recommends always using a block with map and sort. And we'll see examples of using it and not using it. And there are some reasons why you would want to use it. And there's reasons why you would not want to use it. There is a slight penalty for using a, a block form. And that is because it, it gives you some extra scoping. So Perl has to set that up. So if, you're having, if you want to just shave a little bit of time off of your, your Perl code, you can remove the block. Um, and, and the reason why Damien suggests using the block is because it, it helps you um, from, keep from stumbling and accidentally um, having your syntax wrong. And if you have played with this much, you will have run into that problem. So let's dig into map. Map is kind of like a for each. If you understand a for each, you say for each is goes through a list and then you do something for each element of the list. So here we have an example of a simple for each that we're going to show you how a map would do the same, exact same thing with a, a map syntax. So here we have uc, which takes a, a string and upcases it, forces it all to uppercase. So we see upcase line and then put that back into line. So we're going through and we're taking that array and fa basically forcing everything to uppercase. So to do that with map, all we have to do is say lines equals map uppercase and give it the list. It's a little simpler than a for each. Here we're using it without the block notation, so it'll be a little bit more efficient. There's an alternate form using the block. Those are all equivalent lines. Now one thing that's interesting is we have this map you see at lines, we can get a for each that actually does the same thing. That's what we call an inside out for each in this form. 
Some of you may have not seen this before. It's equivalent to the map, because what we're doing is we're saying for each element in the at lines array, do the uppercase assigning it to dollar underscore. And it'll use what is in dollar underscore to upcase. I'm not a big fan of the inside out, because reading it, it looks a little funny. And you're reading through and you're going, okay, dollar underscore equals upcase, what? And then you go, oh, they're doing the inside out for each. But it has some efficiencies. It's actually faster than the map. So here's the normal right side out for each that does the exact same thing. But it's a little bit slower than the inside out version because we have to introduce that code block that gives us some scoping. So you're saying a, a looping variable here? Is that, is that for scoping for speed-wise, is that, is that the same speed or is it? If you're adding a looping variable, you're actually um, just replacing what's in the default dollar underscore. I, I'm not sure the performance difference between using that and dollar underscore. It's, that's something I, I haven't tested. It's fairly easy to do. Um, there's a lot of ways to check that. Um, but the the inside out form is the fastest of these three, three versions. It's generally accepted that MAP is, is really best at creating new lists, whereas for each is best for transforming a list. But you can use them either way. So just be aware that, that you have that option to go either way. But generally speaking, MAP will be best for creating new lists. For each is best for transforming a list. Now, an example of using a map where you might have thought of using a for each before is where you're doing something like this, where you're dumping out individual paired elements of a hash. You've probably seen this syntax before, where you loop through and print out the hash key and value. You can do the exact same thing in a map. You can also do it inside out. Generally, a map in void context like this is kind of frowned upon because what you're doing is you're creating a list and that you're not, then you're not using it. Now, one of the little gotchas with map is that the, the code block in map evaluates in list context. So if you do a call like this to local time, Local time returns a nice pretty string with the date in it, the date and time, if you call it in scalar context. But if you call it in list context, it returns an array of numbers that correspond to the current date and time. And because map evaluates the block in, in list context, you're going to get a bunch of numbers. And so your uh, dates array is going to be probably not what you intended. Damien Conway recommends always using scalar in your map expressions. So you do it like this. However, there are times where you want that list context. So if we say, if we're trying to get all the words out of a, a, a bunch of strings, like we slurp a, a file in to an array, and then we want to get all the words there, we're going to be splitting them and then just putting them to an array. If we use a scalar on that, we're not going to get what we expect. Because a scalar is going to give us the number of elements, not the actual elements. So in that case, we actually want to drop the scalar and let it be in list context. Some of you may have worked with other people's map code and seen a plus on the code block and go, what is going on here? Well, map can get confused if it doesn't know what it is, whether it's a partial hash that you're giving it or if, it's, or if you're actually giving it a code block. So you can force it to recognize that as a hash by putting the plus on there. 
So that's what that's all about. And this is something you can play with. You can add a plus and take out the plus out and see what difference it makes. Just something to watch out for. Here, reiterating the uh, map and avoid context might give you some problems. That's one thing to watch out for. Here we, we're, we show you creating a hash using a map. So here we have our list of files. We perform the minus m file operator on it, getting the current or the age of the file. And we create a hash called age of that the key is the name of the file. Here's a for each that does the same thing. And an inside out for each, where for is actually a synonym for for each. So we could actually say for instead of for each, and it'd be the same. If you really want to be concise, you can use the for. If you want to skip an element in a map, so you're essentially dropping elements in the list, you can do that by having the uh, code block evaluate to an empty list. So here, if our element is uh, less than 10, then we'll use that element. Otherwise, we use empty list. That will actually drop those elements. That is actually the same as grep. So this map and this grep are the same thing. All grep does is it evaluates this expression in the curly braces and says all the expressions where that's true, it will return that element. So we'll get only the numbers that are less than 10 uh, in, the, uh, in the ones array. Now let me explain Boolean scalar context. Grep is expecting in that curly brace thing something to evaluate kind of like a Boolean, a true-false type thing. But there's five things that Perl considers false. Everything else is considered true. So for example, so uh, the things that are false are zero, the string zero, that has a single zero character in it, the floating point is exactly 0, 0.0, an empty string, or undef. All those are considered false. Everything else is considered true. So if zero is false, if 400 is true, if minus one is true, if the string false is true, because it's not one of those five values of Boolean false, if double zero in a string is true, and if we undefine um, dollar $x, then it's undefed, it's false. So when we look at grep, it's looking for those five values of Boolean false to evaluate, and that's Boolean scalar context. If it finds those, it's false. It'll drop out the element that uh, evaluates to that. Otherwise, it retains the element. So if it's less than 10, that'll give us the ones. Here we're getting the directories. Here we're getting the unique items in the list. There's a number of different ways we could do that. This is just one of them. Here we're looking for the strings that contain the word error, either in uppercase or lowercase. Here we're getting everything as long as it has a true value. So we will drop out things like zero and empty string. Now in the few minutes we have left, we need to talk about sort. Sort can be called in three different ways. We can call it with no comparison directive, which will it'll use the default comparison. We can use a subroutine to tell us how to compare, or we can give it a code block. These are the three forms that we have. What sort does is it takes the list and it compares any two items in the list. And it needs to know, how do I order these? If we don't tell it how to order them, it will sort by default in ASCII collating sequence, sequence or Unicode collating sequence. If we give it a subroutine, it'll take those two elements and give it to our subroutine. Our subroutine returns a value that it's going to say whether that's in order or not. Or our code block can do the same thing. Now, subroutines are rarely used. I've, I think in 20 years of programming Perl, I've never seen anybody use the subroutine approach. Everybody uses code block. What sort is expecting is a 1, a 0, or a minus 1. 
to tell whether things are in order, the same, or out of order. The compare operator, CMP for strings, and the numeric one that we sometimes call the spaceship operator, the less than equals than greater than, those tell us whether they're, they, those naturally return a minus one, a zero, or a one. So we very, it's very convenient for us to use those, and you'll often see those, but you don't have to, um, in a sort code block. There's two globals, dollar A and dollar B, which Larry Wall has defined to be the ones that we use to hold the, any two values that we're to compare. So what we need to do is compare dollar A and dollar B in our code block and return either a minus one, a zero, or a one to tell whether we are in order, the same, or out of order. So some examples of sorting. The, the default sort, very easy. If you want to do a numeric sort, the default is stringwise. So that we, this would be a numeric sort, dollar A compare, numeric compare with dollar B. The de default is actually the same as doing dollar A CMP dollar B. That's just the default. If we want to reverse the sort, so instead of ascending order, we do it in descending order, we can re actually re just reverse the A and the B because it'll return a minus one instead of a one or a one instead of a minus one. Zero will be the same. So that will reverse them, or we can use the reverse function. Sort will order them, and then reverse just reverses them. The reverse is generally preferred because it's obvious what you're doing because not all Perl program programmers understand the A, dollar A and dollar B syntax. Reverse will make your, your code a little bit easier to read. However, there is a penalty because you have the overhead of a reverse call. So that costs you a little bit more. If you actually want to do a subroutine, which is rarely done, here's how you actually do it. You create the subroutine using the comparison between the A and the B. Here we're doing a, we're forcing everything to uppercase and, and then comparing the uppercase versions. So it'll sort regardless of case. We create a reference to that subroutine and we give that reference to sort to actually do the sort. You can also use anonymous subroutines. You cannot use recursion. Anything we can get to through A and B, we can sort on. A and B are just connections to something we can sort. So for example, if A and B are strings that we need to split and we want to get the fifth field, or element five, we can actually do that. We can say split inside of our code block and splitting A and getting an array, splitting B, getting an array, and then compare the fifth elements. Anything you can get to through A and B, you can sort on. We want to sort the, the keys of a hash, we can do it this way. If we want to sort a hash itself by the value instead of by the keys, see we can get to that value through A and B. Anything you can get to through A and B, you can sort on. So here's an example of sorting strings that are dates, where we have to split up the dates into month, days, and years, each version, an A and a B version of those, and then comparing the years, and then using an OR, so that if the, if the uh, B, if the years are equal, then it'll be a zero on this OR, so then we'll go to the next one, because it, ha it doesn't know yet if this whole thing is true or false. It can still be true or false. So it'll go to the next one, compare the months. If it knows the months, what order it is, then it'll drop out at that point, so we can chain these ORs to do this, as, do this as much as we want. Now, I'm about out of time, so let me skip past all the optimization stuff here and tell you that uh, right here we have further options, utilities here that you can do. There we go. List utilities, more utilities. There's a lot of stuff out there to do sorting, and there's a lot of optimizations available. Uh, there's the Schwarzschild transform. Uh, there's the uh, uh, Orkish Maneuver, there's the Gutman Rossler, a lot of fun stuff. That's it for the presentation.
Thank you. If you want to stick around, ask a few questions, that would be great.